Hello, and thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Jami Hodge. I am executive director here at Equal Justice USA. And we are so excited to have you join us for our webinar today, a decade after Connecticut's repeal, lessons for justice reform and transformation. Before we get started, I wanna start with a few housekeeping matters. Um, we're so excited to have so many movement partners join us today. So if you wanna add your name, location and affiliation in the chat so that others can know you're here, we'd appreciate it. We have also turned on closed captioning. So if anyone is interested in, in, interested in that, you can select that. It's usually at the bottom of your screen. And we are recording today. We want to be able to share this in what we know will be an engaging discussion um, with others who are not able to attend. Um, this is intended to be a um, conversation and we definitely want time for your questions at the end. You'll see at the bottom of your screen a question and answer feature. Please feel free throughout the conversation to drop in any questions. Um, we have a wonderful staff member, Colleen, who will be addressing some of the quick, easy questions. Um, and then we'll go there for any questions we'd like for the panelists. The other thing I wanna do before we get started is just to begin with thank yous. Um, and this is gonna take a little bit of a minute uh, because one of the lessons that I think is important that we all, that I hope we all can walk away with from what happened as we acknowledged the 10th anniversary of repeal of death penalty in Connecticut is that it is to get to repeal took um, movement building and it took many, many people. It's also something that took a lot of time. Um, so the thank you list is a little long and it is not exhaustive, um, but there are just some folks we have to highlight because repeal would not have happened without their important effort. And when I, I wanna nod to the fact that again, it's not something that happened just because of effort over several months or even over just a, a couple of years and specifically wanna acknowledge the Connecticut Network to Abolish the Death Penalty who had been working on this issue for a decade before repeal happened. I want to acknowledge Senator Gary Winfield, who was the lead sponsor of the repeal legislation and the dozens of co-sponsors that led to the bipartisan passage. Again, the board and past staff of the Connecticut Network to abolish the death penalty, and especially Bob Nave, Ben Jones, Kristen Bolig, Fran Watson, Sheila Dinian, George Kane, Carol Rizzo, John Kadaris, and Nancy Allisberg. I want to acknowledge the over 175 murder victim family members who spoke out in favor of repeal, the law enforcement professionals, the faith leaders, the civic and civil rights leaders, and ally organizations like the NAACP, Amnesty International, the Innocence Project, Color of Change, the League of Women Voters, and the ACLU. And then finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge Equal Justice USA staff, um, current and former. Um, our leads for the Connecticut repeal were Colleen Cunningham and former EJ USA staff person, Laura Porter, who now leads the Eighth Amendment Project. And we still have um, with us, in addition to Colleen, we have Mona and we have Sarah Craft, who, um, because towards the end of that campaign, it was all hands on deck, played a supporting role, and importantly, that all three are still here with us today doing the important work of movement building. So when we end the death penalty, we do two things. First, we stop the most egregious response to violence that exists, but we also create space and ultimately to reform and ultimately transform the criminal legal system, which we know causes so much harm. What we're acknowledging today is that 10 years ago, Connecticut, Connecticut excuse me, successfully repealed the death penalty. It was the fourth state to do so at the time legislatively. And it happened in a climate where many people considered it was impossible to have a successful repeal. And many of you will remember that climate. Um, it was in the midst of a capital trial for two people who were involved in a very brutal crime that involved rape and arson, robbery and murder, where two girls and their mother lost their lives. The lone survivor from that brutal crime became the state's spokesperson to keep the death penalty. He invested his own resources and hired a PR firm and a lobbyist to ensure that the death penalty remained the law of the land. 
and yet the Connecticut repeal campaign, relying strongly on the voices of murder victim families and particularly communities of color was successful. Understanding what happened in Connecticut, we believe has important lessons for the work that is for much work that evolved and continue to evolve in Connecticut, but also important lessons for the work we are doing today in movements. So I'm excited to introduce the three panelists who are joining me for this important conversation today. I am not going to read their entire bios. Um, they are all very accomplished. And if I did that, we would have no time for our discussion. So please look them up and look up their organizations and what they're doing. But I will do brief introductions. The first person I'm gonna introduce is Kika Matos, who is the Vice President of Initiatives at the Barrett Institute of Justice. Kika previously headed up the US Reconciliation and Human Rights Program at Atlantic, Atlantic Philanthropies. Prior to that, Kika served as a deputy mayor in the city of New Haven, where she oversaw the city's community programs and launched new initiatives involving prisoner reentry and youth and immigrant integration. She was previously the executive director of Junta, New Haven's oldest Latino advocacy organization, and she's a prior assistant federal defender who represented people sentenced to death. Next, we have Vicki Coward, who is a religious leader a grandmother and a mother to, th to three children, including Tyler Coward, who was murdered in New Haven in 2007. Following Tyler's death, Vicki became leader of the group, Connecticut Victims for Repeal. And following the successful repeal in the Connecticut campaign, she also helped to organize murder victim families in other states. She's a member of EJUSA's Trauma and Healing Network, and has shared her experiences in an autobiography in the midst of the storm. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you, Kika, for joining us. And then last but certainly not least is Mike Lowler. Mike is a nationally recognized criminal justice expert and an associate professor of criminal justice at the University of New Haven. He previously served 12 terms in the Connecticut General Assembly. He held leadership roles in a wide variety of criminal justice reforms including a law that established rights for crime victims. The years before repeal was passed, Mike was undersecretary for criminal justice policy and planning to then Governor Malloy. Thank you all for joining us. We're very excited to have you. And we're gonna just get started with some questions. And my first question is for Mike. EJUSA's vision is to build a justice system that heals instead of harms. And when we think about <clears throat> Vision. It includes both tearing down parts of the system that clearly fail us, like the death penalty, but also importantly, building up solutions that will prevent crime and help communities heal. Since Connecticut repealed the death penalty 10 years ago, the state has continued to take important steps to undo the harms, parts of the, or the, the parts of the system that cause harm, as well as build up systems that can prevent violence and help people heal. Can you speak to some of the changes that you're most proud of in the state? And how do you think the death penalty repeal was part of this broader movement to improve the system? Uh, well, thanks. And you've covered a lot of ground there, but let me just say a couple of things about that, right? So actually, if I had a list of the top two or three things I'm, I'm proud of, certainly the ultimate repeal of the death penalty would be uh, near the top of that list. There, that's for sure. I got elected in 1986 uh, after having been a prosecutor for three years in New Haven. And uh, so I was there the whole time, you know, the Willie Horton phenomenon, tough on crime. I mean, people are Democrats and Republicans falling all over each other to enhance penalties for everything, expand the death penalty. And, uh, and, and, uh, and I was involved in maybe, I don't know, seven or eight actual debates in the House of Representatives where we were debating the death penalty, repealing it, strengthening it, making it easier to impose. Um, and, and I have to say uh, that the fact that ultimately it was repealed um, was like a dream in the late 1980s and it became a reality 10 years ago. Um, but I, I think in many ways, given what actually transpired in Connecticut in 2007, which was uh, the year, the summer of 2007 is when the Cheshire murders took place. And, uh, and, and the whole nation and especially the state was 
sort of overwhelmed with grief and frustration about how two recently paroled guys could have committed this unimaginable crime. And uh, there was a, a, a head of steam to just impose all these draconian rules about, you know, the governor at the time, Jody Rell, just abolished parole releases altogether temporarily. And, and so th that was a pivotal moment. And uh, it was only a year and a half later in 2009 that the legislature voted to repeal the death penalty for the first time. That bill was vetoed by then Governor Rell, but it showed you you could do this and it was a bipartisan vote. And uh, as you've mentioned, and I'm sure we'll hear more about this later, I think the, the, the voice that, that made the difference was the, was the voices of so many crime victims talking about how the death penalty doesn't work. It's like a fraudulent public policy. You know, whatever you think about capital punishment, no one had actually been executed in Connecticut except for one guy who spent 10 years trying to get himself executed, Michael Ross, right? So I, I think for very practical reasons, victims said, this is not right. It's not fair. It's like unending uh, agony for us to have to do all these appeals, all the, the, the murderers faces are on the front page of the newspaper all the time when their appeals are heard. So, and, and I think there's so many courageous victims who for different reasons came forward to say, let's just put an end to this. But then in, in uh, 2012, when the, when the bill actually passed and was signed by Governor Malloy, um, also a bipartisan vote, I, I think more than anything else that demonstrated that even in that environment, you could make a reform like this and then survive an election. Don't forget, uh, Dan Malloy, when he was a candidate for governor, was asked point blank, you've said you would favor repealing the death penalty. Will you sign a bill to do it? And his simple answer was yes, without any ifs, ands, or buts. And I think that surprised people. And that was a, 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 that was a theme in the election for sure in, in his, uh, on the part of his opponent, but he still won and he followed through. And the reason I bring this up I think this sent a clear message to political leaders who were inclined to support reforms that it was politically safe to do so. And that opened the door to a whole series of changes that have been happening ever since, including under our current governor, Ned Lamont, um, in including uh, raising the age of juvenile jurisdiction, uh, the so-called Second Chance Society Act, where we uh, made it, a, changed it a felony for possession of any amount of any drug to a misdemeanor. We got rid of the minimum mandatories for possession near school zones. Um, we made it possible for sentences to be reconsidered years after they had been imposed if the offenders were under the age of 18 when they committed their crimes. And we've just seen, just yesterday, by the way, the parole board here in Connecticut uh, uh, shortened the sentence of four people who were likely to have died in prison because they were not eligible for parole because of one of these laws. And, and there's no controversy, there's no uproar. And, and I think it, it really made it, it, it built a level of comfort underneath uh, politicians who have to run for election to see that you could do these things that you know in your heart are the right thing to do and survive politically. Thank you, Mike. Um, Kika, my next question is gonna be for you. Mike has just really laid out um, really taken us back to what the climate was like. And just again, all um, the, it's, you know, at the time how excessive punishment and extending um, crime and mandatory minimums was, was what was happening at that time. Um, you were an inside strategist uh, that was, you know, really working to help Connecticut's repeal get through the legislature and across the finish line. Can you talk a little bit about what lessons learned from the advocacy and organizing in the, can in the Connecticut campaign do you think transfer to other campaigns? And then how do you think the death penalty repeal campaigns impact the criminal legal system more broadly? Uh, first of all, Jamie, uh, let me just uh, give you a big shout out and say how happy I am to see you at the helm of EJUSA for those of you uh, who joined us, uh, what Jamie didn't share is that she and I worked closely uh, at the Vera Institute of Justice and she is a total badass. Um, and uh, <laughs> just her work is incredible and has a lot of impact. So big shout out, lots of love 
uh, uh, for you and congratulations. Um, regarding you two questions, I, I will start off by highlighting four things that I think were big takeaways uh, for the campaign around repeal uh, in Connecticut. Uh, the first is the, uh, the elevation of the leadership of Black people across the board. Um, starting with uh, the leadership at the end of LACP at the time, Ben Jealous, uh, who is an advocate, uh, ardent abolitionist, uh, who really elevated the organization's resources uh, and dedicated a lot of time and attention to repeal uh, of the death penalty in Connecticut. And he put some skin in the game. He came to Connecticut uh, multiple times. He met with the governor, he worked closely with the local uh, NAACP, Scott Esdale's leadership really mattered, the head of the NAACP uh, in Connecticut. Um, the voices of uh, murder victims' families, including um, uh, Ms. Vicki Coward, who's with us today. It was the voices of those who are often neglected and forgotten in the criminal legal system, um, Black voices uh, who really uh, uh, articulated their, their grief, their frustration, um, their animosity and anger towards a system that didn't work for them and a system that is really built on white supremacy um, based on the race of, of, of the victims. And I will say, you know, the other thing that I thought was striking here is black voices were coming also from a place of power in terms of grassroots and constituents, right? We often encourage people um, to join the campaign and to, to do what they can to elevate their voices. And there were two senators in particular that we targeted, both of whom had significant Black constituents. And so the Black voices that targeted them were coming from a place of power, saying, we expect you to do the right thing and we, will, uh, we have the power of the vote. So how you act on this will really matter, uh, matter to us. And I thought that was really incredibly are powerful. So, so Black voices, Black leadership. You talked about Senator Winfield. Uh, at the time, he was a, a legislator. He, um, he really uh, embraced this issue. And I, when I was prepping for this, I came across a Hartford Courant article where he, you know, he joked to the reporter that people asked him, don't you have any other issues uh, that you work on? It's because he also uh, really invested a lot of time and effort and energy uh, to see repeal. So that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is, is EJ USA, right? EJ USA came in as a national organization, again, um, with a real investment in, in resources, both, uh, both in terms of money and dollars, and also in terms of staff uh, and influence. And I want to give a shout out, not just to Colleen uh, Cunningham, but my sister, Laura Porter, uh, she and I worked really closely on this. John Crane, who was phenomenal uh, around communications, um, they were here on the ground day to day, uh, but they also did it with a, a, a respectful um, strategic sense that those of us who live here know the best strategies. So they came with a menu of potential strategies. They lent their expertise, shared with us what was successful in other jurisdictions, in other campaigns, but always, always, always listened to us on the ground who said, well, this might work, this definitely won't work. So EJ and USA's leadership was really critical. Um, the creation of an inside outside strategy is a, is a third thing that I would point to. Um, we worked uh, as vociferously on the outside, we were loud, right? We were not afraid to really turn the volume up, but we did it with an inside strategy um, as well. And so we were working ferociously behind the scenes to make sure that both strategies uh, were harmonious with each other. And I'll give you one quick example of uh, uh, some of the things that we did on the inside that worked. We had a, a, a reached out to a close friend of mine who is very influential. And uh, there was one Senator that we were targeting. She had a relationship with him uh, she's uh, an abolitionist, and I asked her if she would host a breakfast with the senator in her house. Um, and Scott Esdale and I uh, were guests at this breakfast, unbeknownst to the senator. So the senator came to the breakfast, right? Inside strategy, we had um, a very intense conversation uh, with the senator about repeal. 
right? And that was an insight strategy. We thought, well, here's the voice of the, the, the leader of the NAACP. Here's the voice of an influential constituent. And I was there as, as, the, as the content expert. Uh, this Senator actually voted in, in support of repeal. There are many examples of that kind of work that we did the, uh, behind the scenes. Um, and then the last thing I would say is, is you know, John Crane's uh, work on the communications was brilliant. He really focused in a very strategic way in figuring out what are the unheard voices who have a point of view? Who are the voices that we wanna hear? Victims, family members, we wanna hear from exonerees who spent time on death row who were innocent. We wanna hear from powerful people. We wanna hear from people whose communities are impacted by violence. And every day there was a different story uh, that all, uh, offered a different, uh, different angle. Um, and reporters were really struck by not just the, the, dif the different um, constituents that were represented, but a lot of time, John and EJ USA found people who, who were never, had never been reported on before. So reporters were not just offering an angle, but they were also interviewing people that they had never uh, come, across, um, come across before. Uh, can you remind me what your second question was, Jamie? The second question was, how do you think the death penalty repeal campaigns impact the criminal legal system more broadly? Yeah, look, you know, the death penalty, as we know, it's deeply racist. It's really expensive. It's a punishment that focuses on, on violence. You remove, you remove the death penalty and you create space um, for conversations about uh, reforms in the criminal legal system that actually are uh, have a... a a chance at really addressing um, the concerns of uh, impacted communities, the concerns of victims' families. Uh, there's an opportunity to really test and pilot um, potential strategies that have uh, uh, the that are viable strategies that really get at both reducing crime, but also bringing resources to underserved communities that are most impacted by crime. So it felt to me. I'll tell you, I breathed a deep sigh of relief uh, that the, the day, well, we were up until the wee hours of the morning, but when the death penalty was gone, it, it was like, sometimes you talk about somebody or something taking up too much oxygen in the room. It, it was almost like, wow, now we can have the space to think about how we can invest these resources into strategies that work, how we can pay attention to uh, creating healthy, vibrant, uh, communities, other reforms that we wanna we wanna get at, remove the death penalty, and and now you have more space to do meaningful violence uh, prevention work. And then the other thing I would say is, you know, that there were some people, the fear mongers, who said, "Oh my God, you're gonna do away with the death penalty, and crime rates are gonna go up, and there are gonna be murders in Connecticut every day." Well, guess what? None of that happened, um, and it was a, it was a real affirmation um, that we we did. We did the right thing, and you know, Mike at the beginning talked about the kinds of reforms that we we have seen since then, and it feels like the the abolishing the death penalty set us in the right direction towards the kinds of trends and reforms um, that that we want to see in in the, in the criminal legal system that are focused on on justice. Thank you, Kika, Ms. Vicky. I want to bring you in, um, and and before I do that, I do want to. Um, acknowledge, Kika, I, I really appreciate you naming John Crane. Um, I knew in my thank yous I would forget someone. <laughs> um, and John, um, we're also grateful, is still with us, is still doing this work every day. And um, just thank you for highlighting his really important role in Connecticut as well. Miss Vicki, You've, we've already heard a little bit, both from Kika and Mike, about one of the things that the Connecticut campaign is well known for, which is the powerful voices of victims' family members. And you were central to galvanizing that. Um, because of your work, we had a group of over 175 victim family members who were active in the effort in Connecticut. But we also know that your voices weren't always so prominent in the debate. And for a few years, the only victim's voice of note in Connecticut was Dr. William Pettit, who was the lone survivor of the murders um, that killed his wife and two daughters. A year before repeal passed, for example, there was a key Senate vote 
who said she would no longer support repeal out of respect specifically for Dr. Pettit. So can you talk just a little bit about your experience losing your son Tyler to murder at the same time as the Pettit family murders? Sure. Um, that was a real tough time because um, if no mistake, his family was murdered right before Tyler. And everything was about that family, you know, the whole, every, every community felt bad about it because it could have been us. But not knowing that within a matter of weeks, I would lose my son too. Um, it got to me, the changes started to occur after his death. And when I had to one day go to court, um, when they finally um, found his murderer. And there were a bunch of vans in front of the um, courthouse and they were there regarding the Pettit family. And I just, it kind of made me angry. And I remember going up to one of the vans and I knocked on the door and I said, hey, my son Tyler Cowett was murdered. He's important too. And I'm like, if you want to talk about him, I'll give you a, a free report. And they didn't want to talk to me. So I did what I had to do. But it, it was tough because I just felt like there was a lot of racism going on at that time. Um, separating the urban community from the suburban. And I'm like, a life is a life, point blank period. I lost my son. He lost the family. But my son is just as important as his family. And it was nothing against him personally. It was just the way that it was done. And it's, it's saying that, okay, if a Black kid dies, well, that's normal because he lives in the city. He's probably doing drugs or selling drugs. So it's one less Black kid. When his family lived in the suburban area, they're prominent. He's a doctor. They're of importance. And that's dead wrong. So I had to say something. I couldn't let it go. Thank you, Ms. Vicki. Um, one, even in spite of the anger, right, of the unfairness of the very different treatment your, you and your family receive versus the Pettit family, I think one of the things that your voice and those of the Connecticut victims' voices for repeal did so powerfully was that you never argued directly with Dr. Pettit or suggested that his feelings weren't justified. You know, okay. in fact, you know, what you talked about was how the application of the death penalty harmed all victims, including right. him. Um, okay. But you weren't afraid, just as you did here, to name the racial bias that exists throughout the system. And the reality that this handful of capital cases receives far more attention than the vast majority of most murders. And so part of the, the conversation was about the impact, and this was a shift that happened in Connecticut, mm -hmm. was that the death penalty is actually harmful to all victims, whether you are proponent of the death penalty or against the death penalty. And ultimately, your work and others led to this shift, a shift where even the proponents of the death penalty shifted their message so that and stay, instead of just saying, no, this is the right way, they had to acknowledge it's broken. And so they shifted their message and their, and their slogan was, well, let's fix it, don't nix it. But that shift to acknowledge that it wasn't working was a big deal. And I just wanted to underscore that. Um, but then you also were working within the reality, right, that the risk of executing an innocent person, in spite of, you know, all the air the death penalty takes out, all the resources yeah. it brings up, there's no way to shorten or streamline yeah. it because of that risk. And so really, the only way to address it is repeal if it's not working and it's actually harmful to all. Right. So can you just talk a little bit about how you and the group managed to so effectively change the conversation, you know, to get even proponents to acknowledge the failures in such a hostile climate? Sure. Um, first off, um, to think about the money that it takes to have someone killed. I mean, the death penalty, that's a lot of money. Now to experience 
losing a loved one, how it totally changes your life. I know Dr. Pettit, his, his life has never, ever been the same. 10 years later, it's never the same. He was able to probably afford, if he wanted to, to have therapy. You know what I'm saying? We couldn't. If you go and take that money and kill someone, that money could have been used for us. My family right now has never been the same. Never. And they're still not. My daughters are still not right. Every now and then I still go for therapy because it never leaves you. We can use that money for better things. Point blank period. That's the way I feel. Um, it's, it's, it's just, I don't know. I don't know how they think about it, but it's, it is what it is. I think if they would just think about the money, definitely the money, because we need it. We really need it. And I think about these families now, what's going on, all of these deaths that's going on. They, these people need help. And there's a lot of inner city families who they don't say anything about what they're feeling on the inside. They just go through, it's like a fog that you go through and you just maneuver your way around life. And it's so unfair. I mean, especially these mothers, fathers who have young children and they have to work. They don't have a choice. They have to work in order to keep a roof over their heads, food on the table. They don't have the time for themselves, not even to look into it because of the fact that I have a family. I'll be all right. Can you share, Ms. Vicki, a little bit about how you got that message out, you know, um, and shared your story about ways that money could be better used, about the harm that you and your family um, were going to going through and the unmet needs, um, just some of the ways that that message that you all worked so hard to get out? I remember definitely talking to those senators <laughs> going up there and I, I couldn't even tell you word for word what I said, but I remember telling them that, you know, it, it's not fair to know that I know what it feels like to lose a, a child. Forget he's a child, a loved one. And then to in turn say, oh, we found the murderer, kill him. How am I going to get mad about somebody taking my son's life and now I want to take somebody else's child's life the boy that murdered my son he had a mother I never met her but I did meet him I couldn't live with myself knowing that I took a life so I mean it's like kind of being hypocritical basically so I I, I just feel like if we just put them in jail let time do what it has to do let them live with what they did I think the mind is a better source of getting at you than going around taking money from people and just killing off people. You can't kill everybody. It's not right. But definitely going up there, talking to the senators and letting them know just how it was, uh, not being afraid to say how it is. Um, and the juice of just giving us what we needed um, talking to us and doing what we had to do at any given time that was it it was an easy thing for me <laughs> well, we are so grateful for your leadership Mike I want to pull you in um, on, on a little bit on this uh, issue of the impact of the families of murder victims can you talk a little bit about how their work changed the reception of the bill to end the death penalty in the legislature well, so we're talking about politics now. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a couple of dimensions. You know, one is face-to-face -face discussions with elected officials, right? And I think, as you heard Kika uh, talk about earlier, I mean, there was a whole series of, whether it was a house party or a town meeting or, or, or something along those lines, where these one-on-one -on -one discussions took place. So legislators who sometimes only thought they heard the voices of, let's say, the Dr. Pettits of the world, um, realize that there's a whole other dimension to this. <clears throat> and um, and uh, another dimension or another aspect of, 
of, of the impact is at going to actual public hearings on bills where you know the legislators are sitting there people are signing up to testify and and i have to i think we i think i counted once you know what was the ratio of, of victims of homicide who had testified on the death penalty for and against it and i think we had two or three who supported the death penalty and 10 or 12 who were opposed to it. And, and, and I think that is a surprise to people, including the journalists who are covering this stuff, which is the way you know the voice sort of gets out into the community and then back to the elected officials. And, and there were so many uh, journalists who were interested in learning more about the victim's perspective. Why exactly, you know, I mean, don't you think this guy deserves to be executed? And sometimes the answer was, well, we're not here talking about what he deserves. We're talking about what's the right thing to do, and you know what's what's the best thing for us as victims, and 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 it, it just changed the discussion around this whole thing. So there, there's many arguments that I think were effective in abolishing the death penalty, but none was more effective than the the authentic voices of individuals who had experienced these tragedies in their own lives, not the families of the persons who were condemned to death but the families of the people who had been killed. And, and, and I mean, there's just no question that that was the single most uh, significant factor in this. And at the same time, you see the same phenomenon in some of these parole hearings and, and in other criminal justice reform legislation, you, you hear from victims who talk about, they'd be more interested in restorative justice where we're talking about attending to their concerns and to their needs, as opposed to just all about the, the offender, right? And, and, and so uh, I think the voices of victims more often than not, at least in my experience, have been in favor of sort of progressive reforms for a system that has the goal of preventing crime, making sure other people don't experience this, the kind of victimization that they themselves had experienced. And, and, and to me, that's, that should be the, the main focus of all criminal justice reform. The end goal here is to have less crime. And if you want to find an effective way to accomplish that, you want to abandon the stuff that's been going on in this country for the last 40 or 50 years. I mean, let me just add something to what Mike just said. Um, one of the striking things uh, in the reflections, uh, even immediately after repeal, uh, when we uh, engage in some um, analysis of, of, of what worked in this uh, particular campaign, um, and, and again, you know, pointing the fingers back to EJ USA in the best possible way, the strategy to drive calls to legislators was incredibly successful. Um, and that was a really intentional effort to make sure that every single legislature was touched along the lines of what Mike said, right? At the end of this, this at the end of it, this is a very political process. And one of the anecdotal pieces of information we heard back from legislators is that on this issue, this was the issue where they had most constituent contact, that they had never had so many people reach out to them about an issue that they cared about. And so, you know, going back to the beginning of the conversation in a deeply political process, it is really important uh, to drive uh, contact between uh, constituents uh, and legislators, uh, both numerically, but also to Mike's point, um, to ensure that, that there are specific voices that, that particularly matter in this debate that are heard. Thank you, Kika. Um, and I wanna just pause for a quick reminder to all of our participants, please remember to drop your questions in the question and answer below. Um, we're looking forward to, to get into some of your questions too. Kika, um, we are literally um, all still processing and reeling from a racially motivated um, massacre that just happened in Buffalo. And so the issues of racial justice continue to be front and center um, as we think about movement work. Um, and you talked about in your earlier response how the Can Connecticut campaign framed repeal as a racial justice issue. You talked about the involvement of the local and national NAACP, you know, I'll throw out also the Donahue report, which talked about the arbitrariness of which cases were made death cases. Um, but what do you see as the connection between the racism and the death penalty and the racism throughout the rest of the system? And how did the frame of the Connecticut campaign make it easier to enact subsequent reforms that are that put racial justice front and center? 
Yeah, thanks for those two questions. Look, I, I wish that I could say that the um, manifestations of deep racism in the criminal legal system are unique to the death penalty, um, but they are not. It, it, you know, the, the real issue is, is the ultimate punishment is the taking of a life. And I just, just wanna acknowledge that John Donahue is, is here. Um, his study, uh, that both elevated the arbitrariness of the death penalty, but the deeply racist way that it is administered was really critical uh, in Connecticut. The truth is um, that our criminal legal system is deeply racist. Um, and um, all of us who work in this system know that. Uh, and so uh, the, the real focus for us is you do away with the death penalty, right? You still have racism in the criminal uh, legal system we still in this country, in the criminal legal system and outside of the legal system, place value on people's lives based on race, right? We still have, you know, and, and uh, the, the Buffalo shootings are, are a, a real reminder that, you know, over the course of the last several years, we have a growing movement of white supremacists in this country that are changing the narrative and really driving towards um, affirming uh, systems of white, of white supremacy. So we have a real battle uh, in our hands. And, and to me, the answer to this is to make sure that we do what we did in Connecticut for all of us who are fighting for justice in the criminal legal system, which is to both point to the worst manifestations of racial injustice and commit to fighting against those and at the same time, elevating the voices of uh, people of color. We need to be a multiracial movement that has space for the black and brown voices um, who are especially those who are most deeply impacted to be able to lead uh, this movement and, uh, and to lead, uh, to lead this eff uh, these efforts. And again, remind me of your second question. I get, I get so focused <laughs> on your first one that the second one, I'm like, yeah, I know, I know to answer that, but then I forget what it is. And no worries, no worries. It was just, how do you think, um, oh, let me make sure I have the right question. Give me just a second. Okay, the second part is, how did the frame of the Connecticut campaign mm -hmm make it easier to enact subsequent reforms with racial justice at its core in Connecticut? Well, first of all, it was an opportunity to familiarize um, uh, people uh, with the racism that is entrenched in the system, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Again, EJ USA and other advocates, uh, as Senator Winfield did a good job of also pointing to the fact that this is not just specific racism in the criminal legal system, is not just specific to the death penalty, it is endemic in the criminal legal system in Connecticut and we have to do better. Uh, and so moving away um, from the death penalty and pointing to uh, what Mike referred to uh, uh, issues related to restorative justice, we did away with the death penalty. We're now able to focus on, on, on reforms and legislation that I think we all thought uh, once we did away with the death penalty, it also created a sense of excitement about, well, we did away with this terrible punishment that seemed at one point in time that we would never be able to accomplish. And so if we can do away with the death penalty, we can attack other problematic um, manifestations of injustices in the criminal legal system. So uh, Jamie, you mentioned earlier, I'll just mention a few, right? What successes have we had? Mike mentioned some of them earlier, but I just wanna point to, um, the, uh, a, a law that was passed, I believe last week, uh, just as recently as last week that was, and this was under the leadership of, of Barbara Fair that um, that's, uh, severely limits uh, solitary confinement uh, in, in Connecticut. That's a huge success for us. Um, also this year, there was $6 million uh, set aside for gun violence prevention um, that's community-based. Uh, so we have some resources uh, at our disposal um, that allows us to think about gun, gun violence in the context of communities in the most impacted communities. In 2021, Connecticut Supermax prison closed. And I, I know that that, that has uh, uh, been a long time focus on criminal uh, reform advocates. Um, and also in 2021, Connecticut was the first state to pass a law 
uh, giving Medicaid reimbursement for hospital-based violence intervention programs. So those are some of the examples of the space that we were able to create uh, post uh, post reveal uh, repeal, and it's also an indication that the needle uh, is moving uh, in the right direction. Thank you, Kika. Ms. Vicky, I want to bring you back into the conversation. Kika just talked about um, Connecticut specifically and, and some of the successes that came after repeal. I know that your work didn't stop just in Connecticut. In fact, you joined us, USA, as we were doing work in Colorado and you helped to start meet with murder victim family members and to start a group there to elevate their voices in the repeal effort. Um, and so I just wanna ask you the question, do you think the repeal efforts both in Connecticut and elsewhere that you've worked so hard towards a part of Tyler's legacy? Definitely. Every time I hear um, something going on that is positive about the repeal, I always think of him because, you know, as sad as it is, if he hadn't lost his life, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. So I you know, we say out of something bad comes something good. I think that being with the JUSA and then being able to travel around and help out any way I can is it's, it's a definite legacy for him. Thank you, Ms. Vicky. And I'm going to ask this last question um, both to Mike and Kika, um, and then I, I want to get to a, a couple of the audience questions. Um, so you both have talked about the politics of getting through repeal. We want to acknowledge that often um, when politics are at play, there are compromises that have to be made. <clears throat> So during the Connecticut repeal effort, there was an amendment that was included with the bill that was specifically about murder with special circumstances. And it was added to, at that time, 10 years ago, to ensure that people who were convicted of crimes that would have previously warranted a death sentence would make sure to still uh, live under harsher conditions while imprisoned. Now, we know that that part of the statute has since been struck down as unconstitutional, but I'd love for you to speak to sort of the big picture impact of this compromise and how you view it now through the lens of 10 years later. Well, let me start by saying, you know, I, I was in that business for a long time and almost always there was some sort of compromise that was necessary to get across the finish line. And, and without that language, uh, that abolition would not have taken place, at least not that year. That's just a fact, right? There was four senators who, I mean, not many people know about this, but uh, they, uh, their focus was, well, if we get rid of the death penalty, what happens to the people on death row, right? And, uh, and so we said, well, let's go up, we'll do a visit to death row, and I'll show you a, a, a prison where people are doing sort of normal life sentences, and we did. And uh, the end result was those four senators said, well, we just want to make sure that the people who are on death row are not out in general population. It's like, okay, I, I don't know what you mean by that, but they drafted this, uh, this language. And I think when everybody read this, myself included, but including the corrections as a commissioner at the time, we realized, yeah, that's unconstitutional. But if that's gonna get the bill passed, that's fine, right? Because it won't make any difference going forward because it's it's unconstitutional. And on top of that, it's also worth noting there's another compromise in that bill and that was it was quote unquote prospective only. So it would not uh, on in its own terms have affected people who were already on death row or who were being prosecuted for our capital punishment. Now, as a practical matter, I think all of us realize, well, you know, uh, you can make it prospective only but uh, once the, you know, once the prospective uh, language is adopted, it's almost impossible anyone else would be uh, executed. And then ultimately the state Supreme Court said, yeah, you can't do that. And, and, and so um, at the end of the day, it was a compromise that got the bill passed. And I've encountered this in many different contexts, but it made no difference other than uh, it built a level of comfort under some legislators who were predisposed to vote for this, but had concerns which are really political concerns. Thank you. Kika, do you want to chime in here? Yeah, I it, there, there, there is an ongoing, look, when I first started doing death penalty work many decades ago, um, the, the, the easy answer when people talked about what the options uh, were 
uh, as alternatives to the death penalty. And, and, and this is a, an, a mark of my own evolution. I'd say, well, look, life without parole, right? Life without parole means that, you know, this person will never see the light of day. Um, and, you know, over decades, call it wisdom, call it experience. Uh, I do, I have come to revisit this idea that the easy answer uh, is life without parole. I question the retributive nature of our criminal legal system. I think the loss of liberty is something that is, that is a huge, um, a huge uh, type of punishment. Um, I spent some time in Louisiana when I was in law school and visited uh, uh, Angola. I met with some um, uh, uh, people who were imprisoned who were lifers and they were uh, in, their, uh, uh, in their advanced years, what I would say, and it broke my heart to see people in their hospital beds uh, in a carceral setting and that's when I deeply began to question whether life without parole really is, um, is what we should all be uh, calling for. I think we have, again, removed the death penalty. You start focusing on life without parole. And I do think we need to con continually question um, what kind of justice system we want uh, uh, in, in, this, in this world. And so I wrestle, I'm very uneasy with um, life without parole, I think that we as a society uh, can do much better. No, thank you. Can I, can I just add, it exists in theory in Connecticut, but not in practice. I mean, in the 10 years that, uh, uh, that that's been an option for a sentence in particular cases, only one person has been sentenced for it. Uh, and there's three pending cases. I doubt any of them will get that sentence. So, it, it, and even for a lot of people who are do, doing very long sentences that are not eligible for parole, even those cases are being reconsidered now by the parole bar because there's a new mechanism to do that. So, so I think, you know, we're nothing like Louisiana or any other place like that. And, and I think we're, we're very rapidly moving in the direction of going back and reconsidering these long ball sentences that were imposed frequently on people who are very young, like in their teens, uh, when, when uh, murders were committed, typically they're always murders and, uh, and they've been locked up now 20, 30, 40 years. And so many of those people, if not most, are, are having their, their sentences commuted in Connecticut because of this advocacy work. Thank you, Mike. And I just wanna um, highlight Kika, you know, as you shared about sort of your own personal journey um, around not defaulting to the LWAP for uh, life without parole as a response in death penalty abolition. I think it's it's uh, emblematic of a shift that we're seeing in the movement. Um, we know of some efforts in California of coalitions coming together um, to in, including um, recognizing that that pivot, you know, or sort of that default from years ago has been harmful and that that shouldn't be the message in death penalty abolition. So I just wanted to highlight that your journey is reflective, I believe of, of a journey that the movement is on. Um, I wanna ask this question before we run out of time. Um, this question says, um, how far do you think Connecticut has come since it repealed the death penalty? And do you think other states should model off of what Connecticut has done here? And um, Mike, it was specifically for you. I'd love for you to start, but then you know, certainly Kika and Ms. Vicky, if you have thoughts, please weigh in. Well, I mean, we've come a long way, but we definitely haven't done enough. I mean, if we're up to, you know, if I could wave a magic wand, uh, I would eliminate money bail because I think that is a major, major contributor, both to racial disparities and racial injustice, but also just to dysfunction in the criminal justice system. And, and I would do it the way New Jersey did it, not the way New York did it. But uh, I, I think that's sort of on the radar screen of the policymakers in Hartford. And hopefully that discussion really heats up in the years to come. And do you think other states should model off of what Connecticut has done? Well, I think they have. I mean, um, I mean, there's no question about that. Uh, from raise the age to, to you know, ending solitary confinement, closing down the supermax. Um, you know, we've cut our prison population by more than 50 percent over the last 10 years since the Cheshire murders, ironically. And and uh, uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, I think we are held up around the country as one example. Now, it's worth noting, and I want to emphasize this, every state is very, very different. And you cannot photocopy a reform from one state and apply it in another state because we all have very different systems. And um, 
But nonetheless, I think what we've demonstrated is you can do all this stuff and survive politically, which I think is very important uh, when you're talking to legislators from other places. And Jamie, from a movement perspective for me, um, the, the elevation of the voices of people of color, Vicki Coward, Ben Jealous, uh, Senator Winfield, um, Scott Esdale, grassroots organizations, faith leaders. Um, the, I, I, I encourage um, movement folks to think about the racial dimensions of this movement uh, and make sure that the voices of uh, people of color are, are elevated and, and, and heard because I do think um, that piece of the modeling uh, is also something that we should we should pay attention uh, pay attention to. It was very powerful and it was uh, it was unique at that moment. And I still think that we don't see enough uh, of that, uh, not just in the death penalty movement, but in the criminal legal system and other uh, movement spaces as well. Yeah, that's such a wonderful point for us to wrap up on as we are nearing time. Um, I, you know, will just take a moment of sort of personal privilege, and um, I think it is um, what what you are highlighting is to me one of the most important lessons that I hope people walk away with from this conversation. Um, you know, my own experience has always been working for change inside the system or adjacent to the system. Um, and I'm so grateful to be here at EJUSA now, which is an organization that since its founding has always understand that the true power is in the people. And, you know, we always talk about that those closest to the problem are closest to the solution. And so they should be where power is centered. And so if, you know, if people walk away with nothing else <laughs> from this conversation, I really do hope that understanding that we are the ones that we're waiting for to make change and that it takes all of us, that every call, every letter, sign the petitions, um, they matter. You know, those contacts are what legislators listen to. And the other thing that, you know, I think has been so clear in this conversation, I'm so grateful to you all, has been the, we cannot um, walk away or ignore the racism that is inherent in our system and that we've got to be honest, we've got to like not be afraid of those conversations. We have have to make it central to the conversation of change. And so I'm just so grateful to each of you for the incredible work you, you've done both in Connecticut, but nationally um, for you know, sharing so um, openly today your own stories. I thank all of the participants who came today for taking time to share in this important conversations with us. And then I, I have to acknowledge um, a particular EJUSA staff member, Colleen Cunningham, um, who, you know, with others, Mona and Sarah thought about, we can't let this 10 year um, acknowledgement pass without doing something. And then Colleen just took the laboring oar to pull this all together. So we're very grateful for her work. Um, we are at time, we are gonna end on time. Um, so thank you all. And um, we really appreciate all you are all doing in the space. Have a good afternoon.